would like to bring on our next guest. So welcome to the podium. Um, there we are, Jay Powell. He is a CEO and founder of Power Cons Group Consulting, and he will be talking about running effective business-to-business -business events. So I'm going to talk about how you know you need to run these events on a business-to-business -business scale, and it is very different than you know something that's consumer-facing or something, especially a live event, or as we, we like to refer to them, meet space events. Um, but that's what we're going to go through. I've been doing this for two and a half years at this point. So without further ado, uh, who am I? For the last 20, 25 years, I've been on the business side of video games. Um, I don't code. I don't do art. I used to do some design, but I'm the business guy, the one you see or the one you actually never see in the background doing the deals between developers and publishers and, and distribution across the world and all that kind of good stuff. So through that, I have attended countless physical events throughout the years, going back to the late 90s, uh, all over the world. I am very well versed in how physical events are run. We've even consulted for a couple of them years and years ago. So for the last 10 years, uh, I have been running my own consulting firm. We handle uh, the business and the marketing side of the video game industry, everything from helping a developer to find a publisher to helping publishers find better developers and, and pitching you know, great technology to the industry in general. So the business to business part of what we do you know, is absolutely 100% key. Uh, one of my biggest pet peeves in the industry for years has been, at least in our industry, uh, in the video game space is very different than literally anything else out there when it comes to the business and marketing side of, of things. Uh, I tell folks all the time, if you're coming in from a different industry, basically take everything that you know and throw it out the window because it doesn't apply here. Um, but I have always been frustrated in the fact that, you know, we have fantastic teams all over the world, you know, South America, Southeast Asia, Europe, the US, literally everywhere. But for our industry, the primary means of learning and sharing knowledge was to go to conferences. And if you're talking about going to a conference like GDC, which is the biggest game developer conference uh, in the industry every year in San Francisco, even for someone like myself who is in the US on the East Coast, if I were to go and you know get the full package so I could watch all the lectures and learn everything I needed to learn, we're looking at about $10,000. And when you're talking about a studio, whether it's a developer or a publisher from you know, South of Central America or from Eastern Europe or Southeast Asia, it, it, it's not feasible. It, it's entirely too expensive. And so <laughs> around 10 years ago, I was like, how can we get this knowledge that we have, you know, that we assume everybody else has because we've been doing you know, game development business for, for many, many, many years. How do we get that to everybody else? And being a business person, I was like, we'll write white papers. Um, and we did. And then I realized nobody reads white papers. And that was completely ineffective. Uh, and so we did a we do a survey every year um, to the <laughs> to the thousands of developers that, that we know and said, one of the questions was, how do you consume knowledge? And overwhelmingly, the feedback came in in video. Well, I'm old, old by game standards. And I couldn't comprehend, it, it completely threw me for a loop. I was like, and this is, you know, seven, eight years ago. And I'm like, I can't understand why people are doing this, but okay, so they are. So in 2018, we founded an education initiative called Indie Game Business. And the entire objective was to bring the institutional knowledge that those of us who have been doing this, you know, 10, 15, 20 years have, and bring it to the next generation of developers and publishers and do it without a ridiculous fee attached to it. And so in early 2019, you know, we did our survey and we did a lot of market research in 2018. In early 2019, we started a education initiative called Indie Game Business. And that was, it started as a Twitch channel and that was it. Uh, and since then it has grown dramatically in the fact that what was once my hobby in addition to running the consulting firm uh, is now pretty much a full-time gig on its own. Uh, we started with the Twitch channels, then we, you know, broadcast it, started taking the audio from that and broadcasting it to a podcast. 
Uh, and then when we saw the podcast numbers were growing dramatically more than the Twitch numbers, we started using technology that let us basically live stream all of our podcasts to uh, five or six different platforms on, on Twitter and YouTube and uh, Facebook, LinkedIn and Twitch. Uh, and then we've added Discord to that recently as well. So we started getting that news out there in early 2019. I said, OK, so what if we we're doing what we can to get the conference sessions that you typically hear at all of these events out to the general public. But what what do people do with that? You know, how can they do a business meeting if they can't be at these shows? And so I reached out to a, a good friend of mine and, you know, a company that had been managing meetings, you know, for years in the real retail space. And I said, look, I want to take what you do but I want to bring it to the virtual point. So when I set up a meeting with somebody, instead of saying, I need to go to hall five, conference room four, I can say, click a button and let's have a meeting. And that's how it started. And it has been phenomenally successful. Uh, our 10th event is coming up in September. So we literally have the longest running series of digital conferences in the video game industry. Uh, and we do it because we're very focused and, and it's very specific in what we do. Um, and so, yeah, that's it. That, that's why you, you, know, you should be listening to me. So what we're going to talk about is, you know, how you need to run these events. So first off, you need to know your audience. And this gets into what the difference between what I do and what, you know, more of the technology companies like Jared's does. You, you've got to see who's going to be there and what are their objectives well, there there's the next slide you know what what are the objectives for being there you also have to make absolutely sure you're communicating with your sponsors one of the biggest hurdles that we saw in 2020 with other companies coming in and doing digital events it's like we had already had a year of doing them to work out the kinks and to figure out what worked and what didn't work and, you know, as much as I would love to say I was some great visionary in the industry and I knew a global pandemic was coming, that's not remotely true. I just saw a need and that's what we went after. But we have seen a lot of companies that come from the traditional event space and they try to put that whole model, you know, with the sponsors and everything else into a digital event and it does not work. You don't have big banners that you can display in a conference room, I mean, in a event center. You don't have bags that you can hand out that have logos on it. Those traditional sponsored item sponsor things that go in live events, you, they don't exist in, in the virtual events. So you have to be aware of what those limitations are and communicate that to, to all your sponsors. Um, bear with me one second. The, um, so it, it, along that same lines, you know, you have to set the expectations of your attendees as well, because it's not going to be the same for them. So it doesn't mean it's bad or worse or anything else, but it is different. And that's why, you know, we implement the KISS model. And for if you're not familiar with the KISS model, uh, it means keep, you know, things simple, stupid. That's basically what KISS is. So it's not the band. I wish we had the band's model. They make tons of money, but, you know, not really. So the first thing that we learned is you have to make it easy for people to join. If there are a lot of initial hurdles or barriers or things they're not accustomed to, then they're going to, they're just going to skip over it. They're not going to even be there to be doing the networking. The next thing is you need to make it easy to find the right people to meet. And we see networking done on a variety of different ways. And I'm not sitting here saying that one way is better than another because I do networking events that, you know, put everybody into one room and then move you off to little smaller rooms. And so you meet like random people. That is perfectly fine. For the case of doing business to business meetings, what's more effective and what the people are, you know, what the, the business people are after is they want to find the exact buyer or marketer or person at that company and be able to request a meeting for them, you know, without having to go do a whole ton of research on who it is and find their email address and all that stuff. The platform itself is what has to make it easier. 
And you know, that's where you know, my good friend I call runs a company called Meet to Match, and they've been doing this for a long time in the game industry. Uh, and so that's what we do. You know, you and when we used to do all the physical events, yes, you might get a listing of the speakers that are going to be at a conference, but you didn't necessarily know, you know, who was going to be there from a specific company, basically. And so we would have to go and say, you know, you send emails out or do calls and like, are you going to this conference? Who's going to this conference? What's their email address? How do we, you know, how, how do we get up mixed up in the first place? How do we meet up? All that sort of stuff. And it's a pain, basically. Uh, but if you have the right mechanisms built in, then you can literally go, you know, with what we do, you can literally look and say, okay, I want to find the companies that are looking to publish new video games, find the company, here's the person at that company, and you click one shot, send them a link, this, and you basically pitch, pitch yourself for a meeting, you know, your elevator pitch, this is why you should have a meeting with me, and, and you go from there, but you have to make it absolutely simple, because you're not dealing, especially our industry, you know, there aren't, many dedicated business people in our industry. And so a lot of times you'll have, you know, the engineers or the designers or the artists on the video game who aren't necessarily comforting, comforted, comfortable, you get that word out, right? With, you know, networking and, and all of this sort of stuff, but they're the ones that have to go find and do these pitches. And so you've got to make it as absolutely simple as possible. And, you know, the next one is you've got to make it easy to execute these meetings. And so with what we started doing in 2019, you, we had an integrated video solution into the platform. So, like I said earlier, instead of saying, okay, at 11 o'clock, we're going to meet at, you know, ballroom A at the Moscone Center at booth 241, you know, it was literally click this and you go into a Zoom call or a Skype call or whatever video conferencing, you know, solution that you have. And it's one on one, it's private and all that kind of good stuff. But here's the problem with most, comp most conferences, at the same time that you're doing meetings, there are sessions like this one going on. And so that's why for the first seven events that we did, we did not do speakers. On one hand, I was like, look, we're doing a podcast every, every week. We're bringing in experts from the industry. We're doing these conference level talks every week. Anyway, we've been doing it for a year. Why do we need it? And then about halfway through the pandemic, I was like, all right, whatever, we'll do it too. But the catch there is just like at a traditional conference, if you're in a meeting, you can't listen to the speaker. And so you have to make it very easy for people to watch, you know, the missed videos. And this is where, you know, I'm going to explain that we do things a little different because we have a different mission. You know, indie game business is not a, you know, for hire, I mean, for profit company. It's literally a, you know, a hobby that got way out of control. Our entire objective is to make this knowledge easier. So we don't want to go in and say, okay, well, if you're in a meeting, you're going to completely miss, you know, this talk on how to build a, a Discord community. And what we did is we put every session that we have at a conference and every podcast session that we have, it's on our YouTube page. And we tell people in the events, listen, if you missed, inevitably, you're going to get the people that come in like halfway through the you know, conference, I mean, halfway through the session, and they're like having questions that you covered 10 minutes earlier. And we can easily say, look, go back and watch it. You know, we've already covered that. It's right there for you to use. We don't put it behind a paywall. We don't time limit it. You know, it's out there as a resource, uh, as an evergreen solution, marketing solution, or however you want to phrase it. It's there for free forever if you just go and look at it. Um, and, and so, this is where it gets a little awkward, especially listening to Jared's. Um, I I hate 3D spaces and avatars in business to business events. Um, they are cumbersome and they basically detract from the experience. So keep in mind, if you are doing a consumer facing event, that is where you know VR sets come in and you know 3D environments that you can walk around. That's very much wonderful for a consumer because they can go and see the different booths at their own leisure. I'm not knocking it for a business meeting. It's not, you know, that's the reality of it. If we boil it all down, if I'm a business person trying to do a meeting with another business person, I don't want to run across a show floor. I've done that for 20 years at, at real events. And I have actually seen some of these digital events in our industry. You know, I had a friend of mine that runs one and he said, 
you know, we're recreating the conference experience digitally. And after his event, I called him and I'm like, you're absolutely right. You did. Um, I couldn't get in the door to get to where my meeting was. I had to literally run my avatar across a giant virtual space to get there. And then when I got there, the audio coming from my virtual booth was so loud that I couldn't have my meeting. So I had to go and find a quiet corner of the virtual space to do a business meeting. And even when I did that, anyone who walked within three feet of my avatar could hear everything that we were talking about. I love, I mean, I, I absolutely love those 3D events and the avatars and things like that, but it's not conducive to a good business to business, you know, experience. Uh, and I see Chad, like, we should have a debate with Jared and Jay. I was like, that's exactly what I was thinking of when, you know, I was listening to Jared's talk. Um, so remember why your attendees are there. You know, you want them to be able to meet other companies and, you know, have an effective meeting without having to worry about you know, all the distractions that come from, from another conference. And I understand too, uh, our conferences in the video game world are very different than, you know, other conferences. The first time I went to uh, the licensing show out in Vegas, I was just amazed that you could walk into the conference center. It was relatively quiet and you didn't have to like shoulder your way through tons of people to get to your meeting. I, I literally thought the place wasn't even open for business yet. I had just accidentally gotten early. As I explained to my father one time, who's been a sales guy his entire life, he's like, I don't understand what the what, what the problem is. It, it's just a, a conference. And I'm like, yes, but in our conferences, it's like trying to do business when you're standing on the stage of a KISS concert. That's what it is. You're sitting right beside someone, but you have to yell in their ear because the bass or the announcements from the booth next to you is so loud. So when you try to bring that into a business to business event, you're you know absolutely inserting numerous barriers to entry. You're setting up a new opportunity in that avatar space of what if they can't get in the server? You know, I've been to you know 3D events like this where the tech wasn't set up to have enough users in there. So they had literally had different shards of the server running. And if you were, if your first meeting was on server one and your second meeting was on server two, you had to log out of the, of the game, the, the event, and then log back into another one. That's no different than me having to run from one conference room to, a, to another at a conference. Then if anything goes wrong on the day of the event, and it will happen, I promise you, because if you don't believe me, watch any number of huge multi-million dollar triple a game launches where the first couple of days the servers just go completely dead because there's so many people you know trying to log in and get into it that it crashes the system we in the industry sit back and go why did they not see this coming why is this not scalable the reality is they did see it coming and they did plan for it but it still broke you know when you get that many people trying to log into something you're introducing the opportunity for failure, basically. And so you get with that, these effect, these events become ineffective and cumbersome from a business to business standpoint. I want to keep pointing that out. You know, I don't want to have to run all the way across that space. That takes time. One of the key benefits that we told, you know, our adopters very early, and keep in mind, we're doing this in 2019, no one else was doing it. And you had to literally convince people that this was a good idea. And then we got to sit back and laugh in, in the first part of 2020 when we watched all these other major companies trying to do what we were doing on a shoestring budget and, and failing dramatically. But <laughs> we'd already had a year, like I said. Um, you're, you're there to meet and to do business. So at our traditional events in the industry, if you have a 30 minute meeting slot with somebody, you can bet that person is going to be five minutes late because they had to find your booth. They had to find where they're meeting. They're going to have to leave five minutes early to get to their next meeting. So you're already down to 20 minutes and you're sitting in the middle of a conference hall where there are people going by you all the time and waving and, you know, interrupting and you can't focus. You can't have a good meeting because of all the distractions. So, you know, one of the big selling points that we told people was, look, when you go to our events, is a 30 minute meeting is a 30 minute meeting. You don't have to worry about all this other stuff. You're going to click a button. You're going to go right in. You're going to start doing business. So 
anytime you start pulling in avatars and 3D spaces into a business event, you're automatically like setting yourself up for, for potential problems. Um, and like I said earlier, my next bullet point, <laughs> recreating the conference experience isn't always a good thing. And yeah, that's it. One of the very best consumer facing digital events that we saw last year in our own industry uh, was actually done by a group of volunteer indie game developers. And if you're not familiar, so the, the game space has two different tiers, basically. There's the AAA, which is all the video games that you always see on commercials from EA and Activision and Ubisoft and that sort of stuff. And then there's the indie side. Uh, the indies are the, the small teams that are you know, struggling to get out there and they're doing all they can do to get noticed in the rest of this stuff. Uh, there was a group out of Florida who put a, a, con a conference on called uh, IWOCon, Indie uh, World Order Convention. And it wasn't multiplayer, but it was a consumer facing event. So what they did was they used game technology to build an entire series of islands. They had this pirate, you know, Caribbean theme and you could go and they built the booths. They were, you know, had a lot of good variation in them. They were engaging and you could go up, watch the trailer, get a link to download the demo on Steam. It was one of the best consumer facing virtual events I saw all year. And it was done by a group who doesn't do this professionally, you know, and they didn't use anything other than off the shelf, you know, Unity software to do it. So it's, again, it depends on your audience. That was fantastic for a consumer facing event. It didn't work for a business event because you couldn't have multiple people in there. You were basically playing a single player game the entire time. But there we go. So, you know, one of the absolute things is when you're running these events, you have to engage your audience. Um, and for those of you in chat, yes, if you have questions, pop them in there. And if I've got a little bit of time at the end, I will absolutely answer them. Um, but all my contact information is on the last slide too, so you can find me there as well. Um, so one is charge a fee and this is like, well, you just talked about barriers of entry and now you're charging a fee. So what we found early on was when we tried to give away tickets to our conferences for free, we didn't get any engagement. People would buy a ticket, would buy a ticket. They would get a ticket because it was free, but they had no investment in the process. And so they wouldn't show up. And that's not good when you have a business to business event. If you've got people who are trying to meet with other people, but those people don't really care because they got the thing for free. And if they show up, they do if they don't. So, you know, we charged a nominal fee. You know, we charge our tickets start at 50 bucks. Um, but at the same time, we run countless discounts. And, you know, we're very quick to say uh, if you are a developer and you cannot afford that $50 ticket, then we will give you one. We will give you a ticket as long as you have something, you know, in our case, it's typically you have a demo of your game to show the publishers. As long as you can come to that event, ready to do business, prepared to do it, we will run with it. So the question just came in and said, you know, what's a good range of price? It depends. The bottom line is you want people to pay something because that way they feel more invested. Um, the next thing is, Focus on panels, not presentations, because, you know, like Jared said, you get Zoom fatigue. You know, there's only so long at a conference that you can sit and just listen to somebody like me drone on and on and on with the PowerPoint. By focusing on panels, we not only kept an engaging conversation going with a lot of the different, you know, experts that we would bring in, but people didn't, you know, they were able to ask questions live and they weren't just sitting there staring at a slideshow the whole time. It creates more engagement because the audience, it, it's one, it's, there's a lot of variation. There's a lot of different people talking. So it, it just works better overall. Um, leave time for Q&A because these people are coming to events, you know, on the session side anyway. They want to learn. They want to ask questions. What they're missing from being at these big conferences is the fact that they can't stand up at the end of the, the session and somebody hands them a microphone and they go and, and ask a question. With you know digital, that's completely 
fixed. Everybody, you know, can sit in there and say, okay, look, this is exactly what's going on. Um, it keeps them engaged and keeps them on their toes too. But be prepared to seed questions. It's, it's like real life. People have a big hesitancy to be up and stand and ask the first one to ask questions. So what we will typically see is, you know, if we're halfway through a session or a panel on a conference and we haven't had any questions coming in, we always have preset questions ready to go. And so we'll type in chat, hey, somebody on the Discord wants to know blah, blah, blah. It's not always actually somebody on the Discord. It's us seeding that conversation. And once we do that and the viewers see more people asking questions, then they start asking questions. And sometimes it goes past, you know, what you want to do. And I'll get to that in a second. But you need to be prepared to, you know, kind of prompt the, the users to start asking questions. Three more slides, promise. All right. So, you know, use the presenter's decks as lead magnets for tickets. So when we do our events now, now that we actually include conference sessions in addition to you know, the business meeting, our model is the sessions themselves are free. You need to get a ticket, and that's partly due so we can get people's information and, you know, reach out to them later. But it, again, it's also to get them engaged as well. The ticket to watch sessions at our conferences are completely free. You only have to pay if you want to do the business to business meetings. And from the first time when we started, you know, saying, hey, look, if you want the speaker's slide deck, get a ticket. So we've got your email and send it to you. I can make that announcement in the middle of one of our live streams on the conference and literally watch my inbox ping with ticket sales. They're free tickets. I'm not making money on it, but you know, they are, it's an absolute wonderful lead magnet because think about how many sessions you're in. And that's always the question. Are these slides going to be ready at the end of the show? Yes, but you've got to have a ticket so I can know where to send it. That has worked fantastic for, you know, driving more engagement with the users. And then finally, use Discord or Slack for added engagement. Um, Discord is huge in our industry. Uh, and so I, I realize that not everybody is in the game industry. So let me explain. Uh, Discord is Slack minus a lot of the integrations, but it's free. And we used Slack internally, like most tech businesses did for years. But then when we saw that we had a community going on Discord, even from an internal aspect at the consulting firm, we canceled Slack. We didn't need it anymore. We didn't use all the integrations that came with it. I didn't care if Slack was integrated with Salesforce or whatever else. We literally just used it for inner office communication because for 13 years, we've been a virtual distributed office. That was the part of the pandemic that didn't really change for me. You know, I've always gone downstairs to my office and, you know, worked remotely. So that didn't, that didn't really change. But, you know, when you have a extra venue area where people can ask questions, not only does it give them more networking and some of that random network we're talking about where a lot of people get thrown into a Zoom group and they're meeting people for the first time. You know, we see a lot of conferences in our industry as one of the selling points. It's like you get access to an exclusive Discord server. Here's the problem. That Discord server is only really running or only really active during the two, three, four, five days of the event. It's not going full time. But, you know, we've got a Discord server built around our entire you know, indie game business initiative that is going, you know, all day long, all year long. And so you're building that community, which allows for better networking, which allows for better engagement, which involves better sales, and you're keeping them, you know, engaged all year round. You can't, you can't rely on, you know, the traditional model of, well, E3 is always in May in LA. And so that's where we're going in May. Everybody knows it. There are so many digital events in, in our industry alone last year in the <laughs> in the week of October, you could go to a different conference every three days for the entire month and never hit the same conference twice. There were that many digital events happening just in the game industry. So you've got to be able to retain your audience and keep them engaged so you can promote the next thing that you're doing and the next thing that you're doing. We use Discord for it. You can absolutely use Slack. Um, you know, we just don't. So um, there's stuff coming in. 
how am I on time? I'm already over my time. So, Karen, hey. Um, <laughs> Hi, Jay. Yes, you know, it's great. Actually, this is awesome because gaming is so huge. It is really great to have someone to represent that. So it's it's really great to have this perspective. And I know gamers are so hardcore. So I am not surprised that you have this, you know, avid audience and people that really follow you. So I'm sure it's and I once again, I think the potential is probably endless because gamers are global and they're hardcore and they're like, once they're into something, they're into something and that's it. And I also love, I think it's important also to see different perspectives, you know, different industries. It's like, we all don't like the same restaurant or the same clothes or wine. I keep going back to wine, it's Friday. Um, but anyway, we all have different palates and tastes. So, you know, obviously like you're saying, or at least for your events, the VR doesn't work, which I find that surprising because I would think that gamers would be more into the VR. It seems like so gamey to me. It, um, but it's different. Interesting. It's, it's not what I would would imagine. But um, it's great to have that perspective and to see that yes, there are different ways to produce different events. Which today is about right. But the consumer side of it, yes, you're right. It is very interesting. They do like the VR. They do like being in there and they like interacting with the booths. But from a business to business standpoint, Got it. it's it's not. You're just. You're basically right. wasting money. So my it's time. church and state. So, yes, yes exactly. the gamers right. love to get in there, act like they're inside of a game, of course. But when it comes time to do business, like you're saying, it's a totally different thing. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's really duly noted and good for any of the gamers out there to know like, bring your fans in and VR till the cows come home. When it comes time to do business and make money and really scale up on that level to really go back to basics to the B2B, which is super interesting. So, I'm afraid I'm going to have to, um, you know, wrap things up because we got some people ready for the fireside chat but again as we say goodbye to jay uh we will let everyone know they can follow you and find you it will be a part of our wrap up so they can go to your website and your social so they will be able to find you there so thank you again jay again i love hearing different perspectives i think that's so important to hear different voices different tastes and different takes you know different industries do really are going to be hardcore you know heels in the ground holding on to that B2B, holding on to the in-person, resisting the VR, while others are gonna do the deep dive and dive right in. So I think today is about, or, or, or like he was saying, his industry is VR, but not when it comes to business, it's for the audience. So again, great ways for us to um, see all of that.